Twenty one years old young Ottoman Sultan Mehmet II entered into the fallen city Constantinople with his uncomparable army in the 29th of May 1453, after culmination of a 53 day siege, which had begun on the 6th of April 1453. The fall of Constantinople marked the end of the Byzantine Empire, thus the end of the Roman Empire, which dated back to 27 BC and lasted nearly 1,500 years. The capture of a city like Constantinople, which was a bridge beside being a divide between Europe and Asia Minor allowed the start of Ottoman invasion in mainland Europe. The soldier of fortune and a pirate, Giovanni the Genozan, was Byzantium's secret weapon. As a matter of fact, he was the commander of the Byzantine forces, which consisted of only 7,000 or 10,000 soldiers, mostly Genoese, Venetian and Hungarian soldiers, while the Ottoman forces were consisted of 150,000 soldiers or according to some sources 300,000. It has to be mentioned that, about 20,000 Ottoman soldiers in the siege were Serbians because of the marriage connections between Serbian Princess Mara Despina Katan and Mehmet's father Murat II. It is also well known that all the Janissaries in the Ottoman army would consist of converted Christian children as a result of a political choice of the dynasty. Mehmet is said to address her as mom. In particular, the tunnel digger sapper soldiers brought from Serbia while they were working as mine workers played a major role in the fall of the city and the entry of Ottoman soldiers. In fact, Byzantium Empire didn't have certain boundaries at that time and it was consist of the city and the surroundings itself. It was surrounded by Ottomans who were already invaded a large scale of the area in Trachia and Balkans. The only connection with the western countries was possible by the sea. The administration of the city was in the shadow of the Ottoman Sultan. Ottoman merchants, nobles and even soldiers were free to enter the city. It was not possible for the emperor to decide on anything important without asking the Sultan's opinion. It was a city of Greek-speaking people rather than an empire. The people, on the other hand, did not care whose rule they were under, as long as they were protected. There had been an unending conflict between Latino Catholics and Orthodox Eastern Romans since the sectarian separation. The Crusaders, who set out to invade Jerusalem in 1204, captured Constantinople instead, under the command of Enrico Dandolo, the Doge of Venice. The imperial center had to be moved to Nicaea for half a century. The decline of the population to 300,000 from 1 million after the invasion, had caused enough hatred against the Latins in the Byzantine Orthodox people. When we are mentioning the fall of Constantinople to Crusaders, we must also consider the historical background of the hate between two parts. Not much, but just about 20 years earlier than 1204, there was another mass cruelty in Constantinople which, that time, targeting just the opposite part. 
Following the death of Manuel I in 1180, his widow, the Latin princess Maria of Antioch, acted as regent to her infant son Alexios II Komnenos and took the power. In her regency there was a considerable favoritism against Latin merchants and aristocratic landowners. She was overthrown in April 1182 by Andronikos I Komnenos, who received a popular support of the inhabitants. Immediately, as expected, the celebrations spilled over into violence, towards the hated Latins, and a massive crowd attacked the inhabitants in the Latin quarter. The ones who couldn't escape had been massacred. Cardinal John, the papal legate, was beheaded and his head was dragged through the streets at the tail of a dog. After entering the city, as expected, the Sultan directly headed to the most important and symbolic building of Constantinople. That wasn't the Imperial Palace but the Cathedral of Holy Wisdom, Hagia Sophia, which has the most magnificent and largest dome in the world. The old people, women and children had been gathered in the cathedral and praying. With another saying, they were waiting the inevitable end they would face if the city fell. Mehmet approached to the fearful crowd and told them he gives his word that nobody will be killed and they would be able to live in their city. He also guaranteed that they would also be able to follow whatever religion they believe. The Ottoman Sultan had bigger goals than taking the lives of civilians and plundering their property. He was after the jewel of world's emperor's crown. To popular belief, it is an illusion to view the Ottoman dynasty as a Turkish dynasty and a Turkish empire. The only real thing is that the dynasty was believing the religion of Islam. Apart from that, ethnically Turks only make up less than half of the empire. After the occupation of Istanbul, this balance changed even more to the detriment of the Turks, especially Istanbul became the center of a full Turkish Greek dynasty. Even Armenians and Jews have more population and power in society than Turks. In the area orthodoxy has more complicated roots than Islam has. Ottoman dynasty had to get along with the regional beliefs in order to survive and to be able to rule. As it is shown in the maps, the European borders of Ottomans in 1520 perfectly fits to the borders of orthodox belief map. The style of the Turks, like the Mongols, was not a massacre of conquest, but the absorption of peoples. Therefore Mehmet's intention was to keep the compliant Byzantine nobility in various government posts in Constantinople, the people and culture of which he would try to assimilate. It is reported that Mehmed told the dignitaries that they were now free, and allowed them to return to their homes. But then, between the 29th of May and the 3rd of June, negotiations with Nataras broke down. On the basis of their agreement, the Sultan asked, as a token of his goodwill, to allow the Megastu to place his youngest son in his palace. Here we see the origins of obscene historical rumors. Some unreliable pro-Greek historians tells a version that the sex-mad beastly Sultan lusts after the young son of Nataris, who refuses to hand him over and suffers Mehmet's wrath. In fact, it is well known that Ottomans used to have the male children of the nobles to be kept in the palace not for such an unbelievable purpose but to educate as a statesman who would be a bridge with his own people and Ottomans. One of the other purposes of this half-hosting and half-captivity system was of course to hold the important person as leech. The exact facts of the matter are that Lucas Nataras was executed along with his two sons and two son-in-laws on June 3, 1453. This means that he survived four full days after the siege was over.
as was the custom for a long time, the Sultan gave his soldiers permission to plunder the fallen city for three days. However, he limited this permission to only one day for reasons stated later. While the city was looted for a day, those who could escape left the city with the ships of Venice and Genoa. The Paleologos family and many nobles fled to Moria, taking advantage of the Ottoman navy's preoccupation with pillaging. Still, the nobles who could not escape were spared, and the 29 Venetian nobles who had been taken captive were released with a ransom of 800 to 2,000 ducats in gold. Constantine's nephew continued his life in the Ottoman palace and became the Grand Vizier in the Ottoman state by choosing Islam under the name of Messiah Pasha. After the looting was ended and the city was completely captured, Mehmed II declared himself the Roman Emperor and the protector of the Orthodox of the world. He informed the people of the city and the Orthodox Church that they could practice their religion comfortably and that each of them would be considered an Ottoman citizen. Except for some restrictions, such as the ban on carrying weapons, they would not be different from other citizens of the Ottoman Empire and would not be forced to change their religion it wouldn't be difficult for the Greek people to become a part of the Ottoman Empire. In those years, when sciences such as anthropology and sociology were not known, the concepts of nation or race were not in consideration. Especially, the idea of nation wouldn't be invented until the French Revolution in 1789. For this reason, the only dominant and effective element that unite people socially and politically was the concepts of religion and sect. Mehmet was thinking that people wouldn't feel disturbance and wouldn't try to act against authority or rebel if they are not forced with restrictions on what they believe. The title, Kaiser i Rab, passed down to his dynasty until the end of the Ottoman Empire in 1922. For the first century after 1453, the Ottomans were loud about their claims. As Constantinople had been the capital of the Caesars for about 1,123 years, Mehmed II believed that by right of conquest he could claim to be the successor of the Caesars. This would also give the Sultan a religiously based legitimacy among Orthodox people in the Empire. The Orthodox Church also viewed the Sultan as protector of Orthodoxy and believed that God had raised the Turks and allowed them to conquer Byzantium in order to safeguard the Church, falling under Catholic domination and heretic ways. In 1466, the Greek philosopher George of Trebizond legitimized this claim as, no one should doubt that you are the emperor of the Romans. The person, who legally holds the capital city of the empire, is the emperor and the capital city of the Roman Empire is Constantinople. Arab and Persian authors considered the empire to be a continuation of the old Roman realm. In Sumatra, Malacca and the Indonesian archipelago, the Sultan was known as the Raja Rum, the Roman Raja. Mehmed II, viewing himself as legal inheritor of the Roman Empire, planned to restore territories that once belonged to the Empire. In 1480, an Ottoman army invaded Italy although the invasion ended up being a failure. Mehmed's eagerness to invade Italy clearly shows how eager he is to use the title, Roman Emperor. 